What can we learn by reflecting on the third speech by Socrates on divine love in the Platonic Dialogue, the Phaedrus? How do carnal love and divine love differ? Does Plato and Socrates condone pederasty or men boy love? In the Phaedrus is the most vivid allegory in the Platonic Dialogues, the divine chariot pulled by both immortal and mortal stallions. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Plato composed two dialogues on love, the Symposium and the Phaedrus, and they're both among his classic dialogues. The Symposium was a dinner party where the guests were too hungover from the night before and playing a quieter evening giving speeches on love. The guests first offer a series of speeches on romantic love or carnal love, and then Socrates then delivers a dialogue on divine love. Carnal or romantic love can be so disordered that it is selfish and predatory, but romantic love can be a beneficial selfless love if it is also a divine love, where the lover truly cares for the beloved. And the Phaedrus, likewise, has a series of three speeches on love. The first speech is by Lysias, who is attempting to seduce the young Phaedrus into a predatory, pederastic, or a man-boy love relationship. Socrates objects to this speech on moral and rhetorical grounds. First, Lysias discusses lovers and non-lovers, but never defines these terms. And second, the speech is a collection of random thoughts with no logical structure. So Socrates, since Phaedrus is fond of Lysias, attempts to repair the speech in a second speech. But when Socrates attempts to define and organize a speech, he only succeeds in exposing how predatory pederasty or men-boy love can be. His daemon whispers in his ear that he must write this wrong done to the soul of Phaedrus with a third speech on divine love. But Plato and Socrates do not condemn pederasty, but rather seek that all romantic relationships, both heterosexual and homosexual, be purged of their obsessive desire, so they are transformed into a divine love. Although there were Greeks who were wary of pederasty, for example Lycon, the father of Autolycus and Xenophon's Symposium, Plato and Socrates could not directly challenge pederasty. It was too deeply embedded into ancient Greek culture. And do not forget that Socrates was tried and executed for corrupting the youth and for supposed impious beliefs, and that he did not believe in the gods. And the practice of pederasty is so embedded in Greek culture that there is even a myth where Zeus, in the form of an eagle, abducts the mortal youth Ganymede. Ganymede is granted immortality as the cupbearer of Zeus, and his father is placated by a gift of immortal horses delivered by the god Hermes. And on to the final speech by Socrates on divine love. And after the aborted attempt to improve the imperfect and unimprovable speech by Lysias, who wants to take advantage of Phaedrus, the diamond of Socrates whispers in his ear that he must make amends. He must correct this false praise of a carnal love that is manipulative and exploiting. This speech Socrates delivered, not veiled and ashamed as he was when trying to recast the irredeemable speech by Lysias, but with forehead bold and bare. And Socrates begins, I mean to say that as I was about to cross the stream, the usual sign was given to me, that sign which always forbids, but never bids, me to do anything which I am going to do. And I thought that I heard a voice saying in my ear that I had been guilty of impiety, that I must not go away until I had made an atonement. Now I am a diviner, though not a very good one, and I am beginning to see that I was an error. Oh, friend, how prophetic is the human soul. This reminds me of a talk by Philip Carey, a favorite teaching company professor, on how you cannot find God's will for your life by listening to the voice in your heart. That small voice, he argues, is your voice, not God's, though you can train your voice to be a better conscience for you. And what was this glaring error in the speech by Lysias? Socrates explains, If love is a divinity, he cannot be evil. And yet this was the error of both the speeches. There was also a simplicity about them which was refreshing, having no truth or honesty in them. Nevertheless, they pretended to be something, hoping to succeed in deceiving the mannequins of earth and gain celebrity among them. Wherefore, I must have a purgation, recanning my attempt to recast a speech that could not and should not be improved. Socrates then speaks of the various kinds of madness, including the madness of prophecy, the madness of love, and we welcome the reader to study this part of the dialogue. But this leads to Socrates examining the desirable madness of true love, where both lovers seek to serve the other, which is really a divine love. In his memorable metaphor for the nature of the soul, 
Socrates describes a pair of winged horses and a charioteer. Now the winged horses and charioteers of the gods are all of them noble and of noble descent, but those of other races are mixed. The human charioteer drives his in a pair, and one of them is noble and of noble breed, and the other is ignoble and of ignoble breed, and the driving of them of necessity gives a great deal of trouble to him. Now how does the mortal differ from the immortal creature? The soul, when perfect and fully winged, soars upward and orders the whole world, whereas the imperfect soul, losing her wings and drooping in her flight, at last settles on the solid ground. They are finding a home, she receives an earthly frame which appears to be self-moved, but is really moved by her power. And this composition of soul and body is called a living and mortal creature. No such union can be immortal, although you can imagine an immortal creature having both a body and also a soul which are united throughout all time. Now let us ask the reason why the soul loses her wings. The wing is a corporeal element which is most akin to the divine, and which by nature tends to soar aloft and carry that which gravitates downwards into the upper region, which is the habitation of the gods. The divine is beauty, wisdom, goodness, and the like. And by these the wing of the soul is nourished and grows apace. But when fed upon evil and foulness and the opposite of good, wastes and falls away. Zeus, the mighty lord, holding the reins of a winged chariot, leads the way in heaven, ordering all and taking care of all. And there follows him the array of gods and demigods, marshaled in eleven bands. They see many blessed sights in the inner heaven. There are many ways to and fro, along which the blessed gods are passing, everyone doing his own work. For jealousy has no place in the celestial choir. But when they go to banquet and festival, then they move up the steep to the top of the vaults of heaven. Socrates then discusses the chariots of the mortal souls who will seek reincarnation. The chariots of the god in even poise, obeying the rain, glide rapidly. But the chariots of mortals labor, for the vicious steed goes heavily, weighing down the charioteer to the earth when his steed has not been thoroughly trained. This is the hour of agony and extreme conflict for the soul. For the immortals, when they are at the end of their course, go forth and stand upon the outside of heaven. And then the revolution of the spheres carries them round, and they behold the things beyond. But of the heaven which is above the heavens, what earthly poet ever did or ever will sing worthily? It is such as I will describe, for I must dare to speak the truth when truth is my theme. There abides the very being with which true knowledge is concerned, the colorless, formless, intangible essence, visible only to the mind, the pilot of the soul. The divine intelligence, being nurtured upon mind and pure knowledge, and the intelligence of every soul which is capable of receiving the food proper to it, rejoices at beholding reality, and once more gazing upon truth, is replenished and made glad, until the revolution of the worlds bring her around again to the same place. And perhaps this divine intelligence is the predecessor of what the Neoplatonists call the One, the eternal God who gazes passively out at the world, source of all goodness and light. In the revolution of the worlds, this divine intelligence beholds justice and temperance and knowledge absolute, not in the form of generation or of relation, which men call existence, but knowledge absolute and existence absolute, and beholding the other true existences in like manner and feasting upon them, she passes down into the interior of the heavens and returns home. And there the charioteer, putting up his horses at the stall, gives them ambrosia to eat and nectar to drink. And according to the myths, consuming ambrosia and nectar is what makes the gods immortal. Such is the life of the gods, but of other souls, that which follows God's best and is likened to him who lifts the head of the charioteer into the outer world, and is carried round in the revolution, troubled indeed by the steeds, and with difficulty beholding true being, while another only rises and falls, and sees, and again fails to see by reason of the unruliness of the steeds. The rest of the souls are also longing after the upper world, and they all follow. But not being strong enough, they are carried round below the surface, plunging, treading on one another, each striving to be first. There is confusion and perspiration and extremity of effort. And many of them are lamed or have their wings broken through the ill driving of the chariot tears. And all of them, after a fruitless toil, not having attained to the mysteries of true being, go away and feed upon opinion. The reason why the souls exhibit the succeeding eagerness to behold the plane of truth is that pasturage is found there which is suited to the highest part of the soul, and the wing on which the soul soars is nourished with this. Socrates then describes the process where souls are reincarnated, finding their way to earth. 
It is a law of destiny that the soul which attains any vision of truth in company with a god is preserved from harm until the next period, and if attaining it is always unharmed. But when she is unable to follow and fails to behold the truth, and through some misfortune sinks beneath a double load of forgetfulness and vice, and her wings fall from her and she drops to the ground, then the law ordains that this soul shall at her first birth pass, not into any other animal, but only into man. And the soul which has seen most of truth shall come to birth as a philosopher, or an artist, or some musical or loving creature. Lesser souls were rebirthed as a righteous king or warrior, after that a politician or economist, or trader, next a gymnast or a physician, next a prophet, next a poet or artist, who is far down the line, next an artisan or husbandman, next to last sophist or demagogue, and the ninth is that of a tyrant. All of these are the states of probation, in which he who does righteously improves, and he who is unrighteous deteriorates his lot. Socrates describes the cycles of reincarnation. Ten thousand years must elapse before the soul of each one can return to the place from which she came, for she cannot grow her wings unless only the soul of a philosopher, guileless and true, or the soul of a lover, who is not devoid of philosophy, may acquire wings in the third of recurring periods of a thousand years. He is distinguished from the ordinary good man who gains wings in three thousand years. And the implication is some of these souls from ancient Greece are still floating about in heaven and haven't descended yet. But the others, as a philosopher alone, is not subject to judgment, for he has never lost the vision of truth, receive judgment when they have completed their first life. And after the judgment they go, some of them to the houses of correction which are under the earth, and are punished. Other to some place in heaven, whether they are lightly borne by justice, and there they live in a manner worthy of the life which they led here when in the form of man. And at the end of the first thousand years, the good souls and also the evil souls both come to draw lots and choose their second life, and they may take any which they please. Needless to say, this is a little bit different from the Hindu nature of reincarnation. The soul of a man may pass into the life of a beast, or from the beast return again into the man. But the soul which has never seen truth will not pass into the human form. For a man must have the intelligence of universals, and be able to proceed from the many particulars of sense to one conception of reason. This is the recollection of those things which our soul once saw while following God. When regardless of that which we now call being, she raised her head up towards the true being. The mind of the philosopher alone has wings, and this is just, for he is always, according to the measure of his ability, clinging in recollection to those things in which God abides, and in beholding that which he is. And he who employs aright these memories is ever being initiated into the perfect mysteries, and alone becomes truly perfect. But as he forgets earthly interests and is wrapped in the divine, the vulgar deem him mad and rebuke him. They do not see that he is divinely inspired. And the next section, Socrates talks about divine love, those who love the beautiful. How can those who love in this life love with the divine love? Socrates says, He who loves the beautiful is called a lover because he partakes of it. Every soul of man has in the way of nature beheld true being. This was the condition of her passing into the form of a man. But all souls do not easily recall the things of another world. They may have seen them for a short time only, or they may have been unfortunate in their earthly lot, and having had their hearts turned to unrighteousness through some corrupting influence, they may have lost the memory of the holy things which they once saw. Few only retain an adequate remembrance of them, and they, when they behold here any image of that other world, are wrapped in amazement. But they are ignorant of what this rapture means, because they do not clearly perceive. For there is no light of justice or temperance or any of the higher ideas which are precious to souls in the earthly copies of them. They are seen through a glass dimly, and there are few who going to these images, behold in them the realities, and these only with difficulty. And there was a time when, with the rest of the happy band, they saw beauty shining in brightness, we philosophers following in the train of Zeus, others in company with other gods. And then we beheld the beatific vision and were initiated into a mystery which may be truly called most blessed celebrated by us in our state of innocence, before we had any experience of evils to come, when we were admitted to the sight of apparitions innocent, and simple and calm and happy, which we beheld shining in pure light, pure ourselves, and not yet enshrined in that living tomb which we carry about, now that we are imprisoned in the body, like an oyster in his shell. Socrates first describes a soul's ride after death as a chariot pulled by a divine immortal horse, flying to ascend to virtue, but here retains the metaphor of the chariots when he describes how each of us, in our souls, eternally battle between vulgar and divine love in our soul in our relationships. 
Now he who is not newly initiated or who has become corrupted does not easily rise out of this world to the sight of true beauty in the other. He looks only at her earthly namesake and instead of being awed at the sight of her he is given over to pleasure and like a brutish beast he rushes on to enjoy and beget. He consorts with wantonness and is not afraid or ashamed of pursuing pleasure in violation of nature. But he whose initiation is recent and who has been the spectator of many glories in the other world is amazed when he sees anyone having a godlike face or form which is the expression of divine beauty and at first a shudder runs through him and again the old awe steals over him and then looking upon the face of his beloved as of a god he reverences him and as if he were not afraid of being thought of as a downright madman he would sacrifice to his beloved as to the image of a god when the soul has seen the beauty of the beloved and bathed herself in the waters of beauty her constraint is loosened and she is refreshed and has no more pangs and pains and this is the sweetest of all pleasures of the time and this is the reason why the soul of the lover will never forsake this beautiful one whom he esteems above all he has forgotten mother and brethren and companions and he thinks nothing of the neglect and loss of his property the rules and proprieties of life on which he formerly prided himself he now despises and is ready to sleep like a servant wherever he is allowed as near as he can to his desired one who is the object of his worship and the physician who alone can assuage the greatness of his pain and this state my dear imaginary youth to whom i am talking is by men called love and socrates recaps as i said in the beginning of this tale i had divided each soul into three two horses and a charioteer and one of the horses was good and the other bad the right hand horse is upright and cleanly made he has a lofty neck and an aquiline nose his color is white and his eyes dark he is a lover of honor and modesty and temperance and the follower of true glory he needs no touch of the whip but is guided by word and admonition only the other horse is a crooked and lumbering animal put together anyhow he has a short thick neck he is flat-faced and of a dark color with gray and bloodshot eyes the maid of insolence and pride shag-eared and deaf hardly yielding to whip and spur now when the charioteer beholds the vision of love and has his whole soul warmed through sense and is full of the prickings and ticklings of desire the obedient steed then as always under the government of shame refrains from leaping on the beloved but the base steed heedless of the pricks and blows of the whip plunges and runs away giving all manner of trouble to his companion in the charioteer whom he forces to approach the beloved and to remember the joys of love they at first indignantly oppose him and will not be urged on to do terrible and unlawful deeds but at last when he persists in plaguing them they yield and agree to do as he bids them now they are at the spot and behold the flashing beauty of the beloved which when the charioteer sees his memory is carried to the true beauty whom he beholds in company with modesty like an image placed upon a holy pedestal he sees her but he is afraid and falls backwards in adoration and by his fall is compelled to pull back the reins with such violence as to bring both the steeds on their haunches the one willing and unresisting the unruly one very unwilling and when they've gone back a little the one is overcome with shame and wonder and his whole soul is bathed in perspiration the other when pain is over which the bridle and the fall has given him having with difficulty taken breath is full of wrath and reproaches which he heaps upon the charioteer and his fellow steed for want of courage and manhood declaring that they have been false to their agreement and guilty of desertion again they refuse and he again urges them on and will scarce yield to their prayer that they would wait until another time when the appointed hour comes they make as if they had forgotten and he reminds them fighting and neighing and dragging them on forces them to draw near again when they are near he stoops his head and puts his tail and takes up the bit in his teeth and pulls shamelessly then the charioteer is worse off than ever he falls back like a racer at the barrier and with a still more violent wrench drags the bit out of the teeth of the wild steed and covers his abusive tongue and jaws with blood and forces his legs and haunches to the ground and punishes him sorely and when this has happened several times and the villain has ceased from his wanton way he is tamed and humbled and follows the will of the charioteer and when he sees the beautiful one he is ready to die of fear and from that time forward the soul of the lover follows the beloved in modesty and holy fear Although Socrates does not condemn the practice of pederasty, his ideal relationship is not one of physical lust, but a spiritual communion, perhaps without consummation, although this practically rarely happens, as we all know. 
We do know, though there's playful flirtation between Phaedrus and Socrates, that theirs is a philosophical and spiritual love of friendship only. Fate is ordained that there shall be no friendship among the evil, and fate is also ordained that there shall always be friendship among the good. And the beloved, when he has received him into communion and intimacy, is quite amazed at the goodwill of the lover. He recognizes that the inspired friend is worth all other friends or kinsmen. They have nothing of friendship in them worthy to be compared with his. And the approval of proper pederasty is confirmed when Socrates refers to the myth of Zeus and Ganymede when Zeus in the form of an eagle kidnaps the beautiful youth Ganymede. And when this feeling continues and the lover is nearer to his beloved and embraces him in gymnastic exercises and at other times of meeting, then the fountain of that stream, which Zeus, when he was in love with Ganymede, named Desire, overflows upon the lover and some enters into his soul. And some, when he is filled, flows out again and as a breeze or an echo rebounds from the smooth rocks and returns whence it came. So does the stream of beauty, passing through the eyes which are the windows of the soul, come back to the beautiful one, there arriving and quickening the passages of the wings, watering them and inclining them to grow, and filling the soul of the beloved also with love. When he is with the lover, both cease from their pain, but when he is away, then he longs as he has longed for, and has love's image, love for love, lodging in his breast, which he calls and believes to be not love, but friendship only. And his desire is as the desire of the other, but weaker. He wants to see him, touch him, and kiss him, and embrace him, and probably not long afterwards his desire is accomplished. When they meet, the wanton steed of the lover has a word to say to the charioteer. He would like to have a little pleasure in return for many pains. But the wanton steed of the beloved says not a word, for he is bursting with passion, which he understands not. He throws his arms around the lover and embraces him as his dearest friend. And when they are side by side, he is not in a state in which he can refuse the lover anything if he ask him. Although his fellow steed and the charioteer oppose him with the arguments of shame and reason. Socrates concludes, Thus great are the heavenly blessings which the friendship of a lover will confer upon you, my youth. Whereas the attachment of the non-lover, which is alloyed with a worldly prudence and has worldly and niggardly ways of doling out benefits, will breed in your soul those vulgar qualities which the populace applaud will send you bowling around the earth during a period of 9,000 years and leave you a fool in the world below. Socrates then prays to Eros that Phaedrus will no longer halt between two opinions, but will dedicate himself wholly to love and to philosophical discourses. And the last part of the Phaedrus is on rhetoric, since the dialogue began with a rhetorically flawed dialogue, which we cover in part one of Phaedrus on flawed carnal love. Although this extended discussion takes up about 40% of the dialogue, we summarize the main argument in just a few slides. Now we'll discuss the sources used by this video. Barnes & Noble has an excellent collection of the main Platonic dialogues with a classical translation by Benjamin Jowett, which we also found free on the internet in the Gutenberg site. We also included insights which we gained from the great courses lectures by the Platonic enthusiast, Professor Michael Segrew. When listening to his lectures, you can understand how some in the ancient world came to view Socrates and Plato as religious philosophers. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.